Uh, thanks for being with us here in our sermon series, How to Deal, uh, as we tackle what, what I think in all the things we're going to cover in these seven weeks is perhaps the most relevant and important for our church family, how to deal with anxiety. About 18 months ago, I had my first real personal encounter with anxiety. For most of my life, I've been kind of the uh, logical, rational, biblical kind of guy. I'm not super emotional, pretty black and white. The Bible says this or the Bible says that. So I had never seen anxiety face to face until uh, about 18 months ago. 18 months ago, I was working with a vocal coach down in Milwaukee. I was standing in his living room. He he was a great, encouraging guy. I personally signed up for the lesson because I wanted to work on some bad habits with my voice. And uh, as he was talking through this and that, and let's try this and tweak that, or or let's try that one more time, I I suddenly, for some inexplicable reason, could feel both my body and my brain starting to unravel. I noticed my, my breath was getting shallow and my hands started to sweat. At one point, it it dawned on me that my toes were curled up in my shoes and standing vertically. He asked me for one of the exercises to practice being loud and then then to whisper, but my body and my neck was so tense that I found it impossible, physically impossible, to whisper. And the guy who who I know pretty well, we've always been cool together, he he said, "Are, are you okay? And I couldn't come up with an answer. I just told him, I'm sorry, I got to leave. And so I did. My wife picked me up at his house. I got into the car. She wondered why the lesson was done early. She said, what what happened? And I said, "I, I don't know. Even trying to explain the physical reaction I had that day to you, looking back 18 months, I I cannot give you a logical or reasonable explanation, but I I can guarantee you this. It was incredibly emotional and insanely powerful. Because that's how anxiety works. According to the National Alliance of Mental Illness, anxiety like that is the number one mental health struggle in America. 20% of American adults, one in five grown-ups here today, deals with experiences like that, not just every 18 months or so, but almost every day. One in five. And if you've read the stories, you know that scientists and psychologists are still trying to figure out why among children and teenagers, especially girls, anxiety seems to be skyrocketing at unprecedented levels. Some of you know exactly what that's like because one in five means that in every family or extended family, two or maybe three in every life group from church, maybe about one or two in every row who's here today, in every circle of friends, in in every row in in a classroom setting, around every table grabbing coffee after church is someone who deals with, with chronic general anxiety. Now, anxiety, by that definition, is not just the nerves you feel before a first date or a big test or a presentation at work. Uh, Anxiety is when you get stuck in a what-if question. What if this happens to me? And and what if that happens to me? And what about this? And, And what about that? And where most people would quickly engage their reason, logic, and experience to deal with that thought, people who struggle with anxiety Uh, They can't. Let me describe it this way. For most of us, worrisome thoughts are like a snowflake and it falls on the warm cement of logic. But for people who regularly battle anxiety, that that one little what-if question doesn't melt, it quickly snowballs. And one question leads to another and and soon it's snowballed into this avalanche of a worst-case scenario. The the worst possible thing is going to happen and it's going to happen to me. I'm going to beat all the odds and my life is about to fall apart. That's anxiety. Or to put it another way, um, anxiety is like a one-loop roller coaster. 
you know, for most of us, we go through life like a roller coaster. There's ups, downs, there's fun parts. And there, there's kind of scary loops that we go through, but then we get out of them. But the people that you know and love that struggle with anxiety, they get stuck in the loop. And there's a, a scary thought and then they think about the scary thought again and they stay up at night and they think about the scary thought again and it, it turns their stomach and they stare at the ceiling and they can't sleep. That's anxiety. And 20% of the people that we know and love and many of you here today live with a condition just like that. In fact, if you're here today in church or if you're watching at home and you're a Christian, you might live with a condition that's actually worse than that. Because anxiety happens in churches and among Christians too. And some people think it happens in really unique and even more powerful ways. Because while a non-Christian might worry about their finances and their friends and their family and, and their tests and their health and everything else, Christians often worry about their own Christianity. And most of us know the Bible says we should trust God and we should not worry. But when we don't do that and we do do this, we feel even more anxious. I could easily name for you today five members of our church who are here every Sunday, who pray to Jesus every day, who open their Bibles and his word on a daily basis, who constantly wonder if they're even going to make it to heaven. They get stuck in this looping thought that, well, I'm still worried and worrying is a sin, which, which means my faith is weak and maybe I'm, I'm not sorry for that sin and maybe I'm not really worthy and, and maybe God really is angry and they get stuck in that thought. And after all these years, they still wonder the most basic question in the world, does God love me? Am I right with him? Am I going to make it? So my question for you is, how do you deal? If anxiety is what you're living with, or it's the girl you're dating, or the guy you're married to, if it's the kid that you're raising, or your roommate at college, if it's a friend from your life group, or someone you know from church, if, if it's your mom or your dad, how do you deal? I gotta be honest with you that about five years ago, I had no clue how to deal with anxiety. I, I was too logical and black and white. I was too simplistic. I used to say things like, well, that's not going to happen. And I'd grab my Bible and I'd open to the passage that says, don't worry. And I'd read it and I'd say, there, you're welcome. Shall we pray? <laughs> um, by the grace of God, um, some challenges have come into my life that have allowed me to be much wiser. And today I want to share with you what I've learned from not just experience, but from the word itself and from many of you. In the Bible, I found out there are 30 different passages that use the words worry, worried, anxious, or anxiety. And I want to share a bunch of them with you today. And as I do so at the same time, I want to share with you a bunch of stories of brothers and sisters who I believe have strong faith, but deal with anxious thoughts all the time. And I want to share with you how they deal so that together we can deal with anxiety better than ever before. Now, before I jump in, I need to say one quick thing. Um, today's message, as powerful as I hope it is, is not going to fix it. Right after I say amen and say a prayer and you go back, it, if you worry like before lunch or before dinner, you're going to think, it, it didn't work. But that's not how it works. I mean, today, if I was giving a message on pride or jealousy, you wouldn't think, oh yeah, I used to be proud and then I went to church that one time and now it's better. <laughs> no, no, you're wise enough to know like our spiritual life is a journey and that humility and trust are, are like fruit that grow on a tree and sometimes it takes time. So my expectation today is that I'm going to give you a bunch of seeds that I hope you can plant and think about and water and fertilize. So maybe not today and maybe not even this year. But in time, the Holy Spirit will produce the fruit of love and of peace in your heart so that the next time those intrusive thoughts come, you can escape them with the help and the promises of God. All right. So how do you deal with anxiety? We're going to cover four things today. And if you're taking notes at home or in your program, here's the first one. The first thing that you should do to deal with anxiety is breathe. 
Now, some of you are going to think that I'm a heretic for this next part. But I actually think that before you open your Bible, you should breathe. Here's why I think that. Uh, Have any of you um, ever seen a two-year-old who was about three hours past his last nap? And he was freaking out and he's crabby and he's punching mom and he's talking back to dad. You you know, when that kid is being disrespectful, he's he's being selfish, he's being sinful, do you say, well, son, we're going to bring you to church so you can hear the word of God about crabbiness? No, what do we do with the kid? (laughs) We give him a nap, right? (laughs) Have you ever been hangry before? When you're hangry, do you really need 15 different Bible passages on anger? What you probably need is a sandwich. Yeah. (laughs) And there's a way to deal with that anger, right? So with the kid and with your own hunger, we know that there's a connection between our physical bodies and our spiritual lives. And the same is true with anxiety. Uh, It's very tempting to jump in and find the first Bible passage on anxiety, but there actually is a physical connection to the anxiousness that you feel. I learned some fascinating things about your body the other day. Did you know right in the middle of your head is a little almond-shaped thing called the amygdala? You remember that from science class? Uh, The amygdala is responsible, one of many things, is responsible for the fight or flight reaction of your body. So if you are suddenly in danger, let's just say an actual lion like came up here on stage, and roared, your amygdala would kick in and here's what it would do. It would use your nervous system to say, all systems, survival. And it would start reallocating blood from your prefrontal cortex, which is the the thinking part of your brain, and sending it to your muscles so you could fight the lion. It would take blood and energy from your digestive system, because you don't need to digest your breakfast if you're about to be digested. <laughs> and it would send it to your legs so you could take flight and survive, right? Your, your amygdala is this brilliant way of keeping you safe from danger. But, but your amygdala is famous for false alarms. Um, it goes off and it triggers that same reaction in your body even if there's not a lion here in church. Even if you're not actually in danger. Even if there's no one evil in your bedroom at night, just the thought of it causes your body to have a physical reaction. That's what happened to me that day with my vocal coach. And so what happens is sometimes you feel sick when you're anxious, right? Your blood and energy has been taken away out of, out of this system to help you survive. And if I jumped too quickly and opened my Bible and said, let's think about the promises of God. Let, let's think logically about the situation that you're in. Guess what your brain in that moment is least likely to do? Think. So what's the answer? Breathe. Scientists have found that you can actually use your nervous system in reverse. That when you take a bunch of deep breaths, it sends a message back to your amygdala, we're okay. If I was running from a line right now, I'd be breathing. But the fact that I can means I'm not running and I'm not in danger. So let's send blood back up there so we can think. That's how you deal. I read a great book last year about anxiety in young girls and the author compared it to this. This is a glitter jar. Glitter, water, glue, and I hope the cap is on tight. (laughs) Because when you have an anxious thought, you know, when you're worried about politics or your own health or getting sick or traveling or flying in a plane, this is what happens inside of your head, inside of your heart, inside of your body. Everything's swirling around so fast. And if I tried to preach to you and teach you a Bible passage in this moment, you're just too frazzled. So here's what you need to do. You need to calm your glitter. Some of you are going to say that tonight. All right, all right. Let's just calm our glitter. (laughs) Uh, One counselor actually keeps one of these on her desk when someone comes in and just wants to pour out their problems. She shakes it up and says, let's just wait. And they just breathe for a few minutes until the glitter calms down and you're ready to talk and think. 
and deal with anxiety. So if that's you, here's the first place to start. Breathe. And once we're ready to think, what do we do next? Here's number two. We pray. So there are 30 passages in the Bible that deal with worry and anxiety. A bunch of them were written by the apostles Paul and Peter, and they both agree on this, that when you feel anxious, you should pray. Here's what the apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then Peter thought that was pretty smart. So he gave his own version in 1 Peter 5. He said, cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. I love that. I love how all-inclusive those passages are. God doesn't say, listen, I'm God. I'm kind of a big deal. I got a lot to handle. A lot of people pray to me. So if it's something really big, then you can talk to me about it. Nope, did you catch the passages? Cast all, all of it. If you told your best friend about everything you worried about, she would want some space from you. But God never needs space. He is a father of bottomless compassion. You never run out of minutes in your conversation and connection with God. There's not a single thing, no matter how big or how small, how logical or how crazy it might seem to others, where your father in heaven will ever roll his eyes. No, he he says, come to me. You're my kid. I, I don't want you to live like this. I don't want you to be afraid. Cast it on me. Tell me what you want. Tell me how I can help. I don't want you to be anxious about anything, so cast everything on me. That's what one sister here in the faith does. Uh, There's a woman who's been coming to our church for a few years who has always struck me as an incredibly strong Christian. I know that she's been through a lot in her life, and yet here she is without shaken faith, but closer to God than ever before. A couple weeks ago, however, we were in the lobby and I overheard her mention that for her entire life, she's had to deal with anxiety. And so as I got ready to speak with you today, I reached out to her and I said, how how do you deal? And she said that I could share her story with you. Her anxiety started, unfortunately, tragically young because her father was not a good man. Uh, He was abusive and he was dangerous. And so as a very little girl, she had to learn how to deal. She was always in fight or flight mode, always conscious of what kind of mood her father was in, you know, not wanting to set him off. And, but as she got older and separated herself from that danger, she, she started to realize that not everyone was dangerous. That she didn't always have to live in panic mode. So she needed to figure out how to, how to fight those intrusive thoughts. And so I asked her, how how do you? This is what she said. How do I deal? I don't. I don't handle anxiety because I can't handle anxiety. It is only through Christ that victory is found. I I love that line. Uh, I picture this woman desperately praying, "God, God, I can't. I can't make myself stop thinking about something. How do do you even do that? But you can help. All right, so I want to encourage you to to pray. For some of you in your clear, non-anxious moments, maybe you write out a simple 911 prayer, God help. Maybe you write down this passage, cast all your anxiety on him. Maybe you put a couple of note cards by your bed or in your Bible so that when your brain isn't working well, you can run to the word and say, "But, but God cares and God wants to help. I don't just have to breathe and use some physical technique. There is a spiritual power that I can tap into. And so I pray. How do you deal? And then third, you seek. From cover to cover in the Bible, there are 30 passages on worry and anxiety, but eight of them are found in the exact same spot. 
Some of you know the famous words that Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount about worry. He was talking about the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. And if God takes care of these things that don't have a soul, how much more will he take care of his kids that do? And in that teaching in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus spoke these words. He said, do not worry about your life. Pretty all-inclusive, huh? But here's what you should do. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. If you're feeling anxious, if someone you love is feeling anxious, you should pray and then you should seek. You should go after, you should think about as much as you can. You should talk to each other about the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God. Now, uh, if you're new to the Bible, uh, that might not mean much to you, but it is beautiful. Here's why. The kingdom of God is the place where God is the king. You know, picture an ancient city like Jerusalem with these big high walls that you couldn't get past and gates and bars and towers and guards. Inside that kingdom, God is the king and he rules with authority and he uses his authority for your safety. So if you believe in Jesus, by the grace of God and the love of God, you are part of the kingdom of God. And that means that King Jesus is going to keep you safe. All right, the devil's a roaring lion and he can prowl around outside the walls and he can roar and he can lie and he can accuse you and he can tell you what if this and what if that. But the one thing he can't do is get through the gates that are barred with the blood of Jesus Christ. And he cannot get you. That's his kingdom. Like I said, I know so many Christians who think, well, what if I don't make it? And what if my faith isn't strong enough? And, and what if my worry and my sin is too much? And what if I lose my salvation? Seek the kingdom because King Jesus isn't going to let you go. All right? And if any of you here today or any of you at home are worried about your salvation, if you're panicking because you think your faith is just too small, let me preach at you. All right? This next part is no suggestions. This is preaching. This is not my opinion, my word. This is the word of your King Jesus. He said, I'm your shepherd. You're my sheep. And no one will snatch you out of my hands. Any of you Bible scholars know what no one means? No one. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, there is nothing, not life, death, not angels, not demons, not the present or the future, there is nothing in all of creation that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Any of you scholars know what the word nothing means? Nothing. In the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul said this, the God who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. He's going to finish it. He's going to get you to the finish line. He will get you to heaven. Do any of you scholars know what the word will means? It means will. (laughs) And one last time, if you didn't get my point just yet, the Bible says that if you're a Christian, God put the Holy Spirit into your heart as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. You want to guess what the word guarantee means? It means guaranteed. It means that you're going to be okay. I know you don't believe that and I know you don't think that, but you're going to be okay. And the devil can lie to you and he can accuse you that you're not good enough and he can roar, but you are inside the kingdom and King Jesus ain't letting you out. That's his righteousness. By the blood of Jesus, you have been made right with God. In fact, this passage, for some of you, should become your next tattoo. And I think your next tattoo based off of this passage should be just one word. His. Do any of you love the possessive pronoun as much as I do? (laughs) I'll take you all the way back to third grade. You remember the possessive pronoun? My, yours, theirs, his. Did you catch that passage? What should you seek? What should you think about when you're anxious? His righteousness. If it said, seek your righteousness, you'd you'd have to constantly think, am I doing the right thing? Am I living the right life? Am I good enough for God? Am I right with God? But it doesn't say that. It says his. His. I'm thinking about how Jesus did the right thing. How he was righteous. How at the cross, when he bled and died for me, on Easter morning, when he rose from the grave for me, he he single-handedly made me right with the Father. And when you're anxious, these are the things that we seek. 
That's what one brother in the faith told me to tell you. I know a guy, I won't name his name. Um, he loves Jesus and he worries about his faith all the time. Uh, he's actually a guy who sometimes gets to teach the Bible and tell people that they're saved. And about once a month, he emails me and asks me if he's saved. And I've known him long enough and loved him long enough that I always know what to say to him. Let's stop talking about you. Let's talk about Jesus. And I emailed him before this message and I said, hey, I'm going to talk to people about anxiety. What should I say? And here's what he told me to say. Mike, when you see people sitting in those chairs, make sure they know that Jesus loves them even when they're not trusting Jesus like they should. So let me take his advice and remind you that you're loved not because you're a great person, not because you trust as much as you should. He loves you because he does. That's one of my favorite anxiety passages, Psalm 94. It says this, when I said, my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Maybe you should add to your tattoo, not just a his, but a your. When anxiety was great within me, not after I, I cured my anxiety, in the moment that it happened, God, your consolation, your unfailing love supported and brought me joy. Seek the promises of God, the love of God, and you'll know how to deal. So, first, second, third, and now finally today, group. Don't just bring God, bring other people into the battle. There's a woman from our church who's dealt with anxiety for a long time. In fact, she leads the life group we have at our church to help people with anxiety and depression. And she says, you should sign up for it today. Uh, I asked her, hey, you've, you've helped a lot of people in our church community deal with anxiety. What, what should I tell our church? And here's what she told me to tell you. Quote, group, comma, group, comma, group, comma, group, comma, group, period, end of quote. <laughs> See, she's really smart. Here's what she knows, and some of you know this. When you're stuck in your own head, you know, when you're in the loop, when the snowball is going, re remembering to breathe and to pray and to seek is really hard. And that's why God gave us this. That's why our church must never, ever, ever become the place where you come and fake it, right? That's why when we pray for each other, it, it can never, ever, ever devolve into, please keep grandma safe as she drives to see us this weekend. This is why prayer has to be, I'm freaking out and I need y'all. I'm not doing great. I'm depressed. Help. And that's where group is so good. Proverbs chapter 12, my last passage for today, says anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. It's the kind word of a father who helps his daughter get out of the cycle. It's the kind word of the gospel that a friend gives to another friend saying, hey, just breathe with me for a bit. It's the kind word that we might share in the lobby at church saying, can I pray for you? Like, right now, pray for you. It's a kind word of a roommate who, who says, let's not forget Jesus is still on his throne and he is your king and he made you right with God. When, when we can't think of God ourselves, when our memory is clouded and, and our glitter is all riled up, it is sometimes the people in our lives that help us out of it. That, that's how we deal with almost everything and anxiety is no exception. So, if you want to know how to deal, the next time worrisome thoughts come, you breathe, you pray, you seek, and you group. Before I say amen, though, I want to show you this. There's a lot of pictures I love in my house. 
but this one is my favorite. Uh, if you offered me $1,000 on the way out of church, I would not sell this to you. Uh, because a few years ago, anxiety became the unwelcome guest in my own home. And it didn't want to leave. And so we bought and we framed this. I'll show you a picture on the screen so you can see it more clearly. This is how my family deals. We look at this picture and we, we breathe. And then we pray, not to some distant God, but to our good shepherd. We remember that we are like helpless little lambs who are defenseless against a roaring lion. But we have a good shepherd who holds us in his hands. And we look at Jesus, who's not panicking, he's not running, he's not fighting, he's sitting at the right hand of God where he rules over the universe and every last thing that we're worried about. And he holds in his hand a pen and as he writes our stories and makes plans for our future and they're not plans to harm us, but to give us hope. A future that is for sure guaranteed and going to be okay. But our favorite part is his hand. The hand he holds us with. That still bears the scar. That reminds us today we are forgiven for every worrisome thought. And one day soon, this same king, Jesus, will appear in the sky and he will make all things new. Even us. And even you. Does praying in front of this picture fix it? Sometimes. Does it bring us closer to Jesus? Always. And Jesus? He's how you deal. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your unfailing love. Um, if we had to be good people to get into your kingdom or above average people or improving people, <laughs> that, that thought would consume us. Thank you, Jesus, that you choose the weak, the sinful, those who are dead in sin, and you give us life. It is only because of unfailing, unconditional love, what we call grace, that we find any hope, peace, or confidence today. Father, today I pray not just for my family, but for every family who's here, everyone who's watching, everyone who's listening. Uh, all of us are someone or know someone who deals with great anxiety. And I pray that today would help. God, let the truths of your word today be the water, the sun, and the fertilizer that helps this little seed grow so that someday very soon, those same thoughts wouldn't have the same power over us. God, I, I know how hard nights can be when you're worried. And I know how good they can be when you're trusting. Give us less of the former and more of the latter as your spirit produces the fruit of peace and of faith in our hearts. And finally, God, I pray that you would clothe this church with compassion. If 20% of adults struggle with anxiety, that means that 80% of us here don't. But God, as we learned today, we need each other. Help us not to be bothered or burdened by someone else's anxiety, but consider it a pleasure to walk with them and be a glimpse of your caring heart. God, close us with compassion, gentleness, humility, and patience that we could take the hands of brothers and sisters and seek you together where true peace is found. God, we love you, but you love us more. We love you now, but you loved us first. Let that love be our peace and our joy today. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.